Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Waltic for this invitation. I want to thank uh, René Vasquez Diaz. I want to thank you for being here uh, away from that beautiful sun outside. If you come to the bar, I promise that I will reinforce you with sun. Well, my presentation here, I have, I'm going to read my presentation. I hate to read presentations, but since I am a talkative Cuban and he is an authoritarian Cuban, which is a strange feature for Cubans, uh, I, I do it to make it into three minutes. I'm going to talk about the way Cuban reality has been, Cuban reality inside has been portrayed outside in and out. And it has to do with the value of words, because those words used to portray Cuba have had a very powerful uh, value in terms of uh, transmitting meaning and representation and portraying Cuba reality. The title is The Construction of Cuba and the Cubans in Mass Culture Narratives. And it has a quote Quote, the revolution had been a complete failure in its announced objects. More than that, it had proven to everyone in and out of Cuba the futility of Cuban politics. George Marvin, Keeping Cuba Libre, 1917. Not, not 1970, 1917. The formation and distribution of images and representation of what is Cuba and who are the Cubans crafted by world, world mass culture, especially broadcast by the mass narratives of the United States throughout the 20th century and beyond, is a subject matter that has not been systematically investigated. Indeed, the issue is barely addressed in the studies of contemporary Cuba, and if approached at all, it usually doesn't go beyond 1958. Very few of the authors have examined how these and other narratives manufacture a literary and visual memory that is encoded within historical patterns, becoming knowledge mediators as well as carriers of a very powerful global cultural representation of contemporary Cuba, influencing and even the ones Cubans have about themselves. I will discuss here some of these emerging issues and patterns found in the representation and images of Cuba and the Cubans. I will look at this evolution over time, its reproduction and transformation, as well as the intercultural nature of such visions of the island and its inhabitants. I will rely on materials from popular magazines, films, tourist guides, and novels produced in the last 100 years. Number one, Cuba in the Western imagination, nature, society, and politics. The country of Cuba its racial relations, sexuality, psychology, and the way the people carry on within the family, religion, or involving. All of these are decoded through the lenses that the North Americans see and represent themselves. They compare the Cubans against their, their own imagined North American social relations, civic culture, and political values. The construction of Cuba and the Cubans is refracted through such inter intercultural prism. The discourse that constructs, constructs what the island is, is evokes images of the Garden of Eden, the promised land, just as the chroniclers recorded their enchantment with a new world. The natural landscape encapsulated in a small scale and just nearby, the representation of a legendary and exotic world. Nature is described as untouched and filled with a diversity of marvelous creatures and plants. According to the magazine Century, 1920, Cuba was characterized by hordes of workers whose families, with incredible fecundity, walk around barely dressed and pile up at the doors of their chanties, quote, like savage animals that look for the first time the world outside, unquote. Citations are very telling. Quote, these humans are like the ant nest in the crotches and the trees. This seem as little a part of the modern world as the shelter of some prehistoric Robinson Crusoe. The primitive image of the island is projected onto the 1950s in depicting difficulties to reach places such as the Keys, the Cuban Keys. 
Poor children of the Keys live, quote, like young and healthy seals, unquote, just resting by the side of the sea. The rustic environment of poverty would express a primitive environment as well as the happiness of simple people. This easy-going air, this is a quote, this simple giving of love and understanding is a habit on the island and the key. This easy family loves sets the tone on the island. The outside world and its pressures are immeasurably far away from the children. They never see money. Happiness is measured by her family, her friends, her school and teachers, the beach and the sea. The island is sufficient. 1953. Even the Modelo prison, a prison that is already closed down, but very important prison in Cuba, the largest jail in Cuba, found at the Isle of Pines, is depicted in a complacent manner. Quote, the buildings are 3,000 prisoners, excuse me, the buildings for the 3,000 prisoners and the handsome houses where the employees live are painted a cheerful, fresh peach yellow. <laughs> they, they are green grass and flowers, so the place has a warm look. Cuba from the start of the 20th century is represented in highly tinted political terms. The primordial vision is that Cubans have no appreciation at all for the law. This is 1905. Quote, the majority of the people of Cuba do not want a good law. It would spoil all their fun. You cannot say word an electorate which is founded upon universal suffrage when he doesn't want to be safe for it. Such condition is attributed to a lack of identification with institutions or with government, and is due to a lack of a genuine press. The lack of civil responsibility and public conscience in Cuba is largely due to the lack of real journalism. With us, a newspaper has a relational responsibility to the public, but that is the last thing a Cuban newspaper set out to do or to be. In Havana, there are 37 daily newspapers, more than twice as many as are self-supported in New York. These are not really newspapers at all. They are organs, political pamphlets, propaganda. They are talking about 1917. That perspective is not exclusively attached to Cuba. In general, it is considered that Latin Americans have the tendency to follow leaders rather than political parties or principles, that they are individualists who tend to consider liberty a personal attribute rather than a political one, and that Latins are passionate and follow abstract values such as order. A factor influencing vision of Cuba is ambivalence about its political reality. Since the country is perceived as incapable of self-government, which is the cause of chaos, irrationality, tur turbulence, and corruption, a strong armed governments are justified as capable of imposing order and social peace, a necessary evil, rationalizing the, pre the absence of true democracy. Number two, Cubans, race and tropical psychology. For some authors, Cubans were a race. There are references to the human racial type or the real Cuban. The visitors marvel when they perceive much equality between blacks and whites in Cuba. Comparatively speaking, in Cuba, the black would seem to be socially, politically, and labor-wise unequal, which seems offensive in the United States. The Cuban whites seem to accept without resentment the black population. Quote, the schools, the churches, the theaters, the hotels, the beaches, the trolleys, the steamships, in all of them, the black and the white are equally present. Unquote. Half a century later, however, the Saturday evening post, 1951, reported contradictory images of equal representation. It was asserted that a third of the non-white Cubans were a backward minority. The article attributed to the Communist Party the exploitation of black discontent, which would explain, quote, that the majority of the 140,000 members of the party are African descendants, unquote. The stereotypes about the physical features of the Cuban vary, but the depictions reveal a psychological and moral projection. In 1957, the magazine holiday picture, quote, that Napoleonic strain one finds throughout the island republic. Round, short neck, and his hair look as if, as if it had been carved out of a coconut. 
when in the usual platinum gray light suit and a pair of a hat. 